Alrighty, you guys probably thought you were done with class. Um, I've got just a real quick little um, topic I want to visit with you about. So we're going to do it in the form of a scenario. So you guys are paged out to a 26-year-old boy who is having severe pain in both legs. So 26 months, um, he's two years old. Um, when you get there, um, he's lying on the couch. He's clutching his teddy bear and he is crying uncontrollably and he looks like he's in a lot of pain. Um, Dad meets you at the door and tells you that his son um, has sickle cell disease and that the, uh, the pain has begun about two hours ago um, but has steadily gotten worse and he's um, unable to move the child because it causes so much pain. Okay. So we're going to use what we call the uh, PAT or, or Patient Assessment Triangle with our kids. Um, this is a great tool to use and uh, works great with kids. So we're actually going to start this at the door. So when we um, start to approach the patient, when we get in the same room with the patient, uh, from the door we we're going to look and we're going to look at appearance. So appearance is how is the child responding? Um, is he sitting in mom's lap? Is he laughing and talking with parents? Um, is he playing with his toys? Is he curled up in a ball? Are they completely lethargic? So are they acting normally in their circumstance uh, for their age? So we want to look at uh, maybe positioning. Um, how are they positioned? Are they hiding under blankets? Are they hiding behind mom? Are they lying listless on the couch with their arms uh, and legs just kind of hanging there? Um, and, and what would be normal for their age range. We're also going to look at maybe how they're positioned. Uh, if they're sitting in a tripod position, bolt upright, that is certainly something to recognize. Now the reason we want to do this from the door is because when a stranger approaches a little child or you know a toddler um, and even a teenager to some degree, they change. Um, they they react to they start reacting to you the stranger rather than reacting to their environment. So we want to get them in in their normal environment uh, and assess them that way if we can. The next thing we want to look at is over here called work of breathing. Um, as we've talked about in class, breathing should not take any effort. It should be effortless and mindless. So if they're working to breathe, um, that's a problem, and we need to note that. And then the third thing we're looking at is circulation to the skin. So primarily skin color and um, we're going to look for bleeding. So for this kiddo, um, we're going to look at his appearance. Um, he's on the couch, he's alert, he's agitated, he's crying, he recognizes that you're there, he makes eye contact with you. So not really any abnormalities in that area other than the fact that he looks like he's in pain. So if we look at his breathing, um, maybe may breathing just a, a little bit fast, but he is not working to breathe at all. He's not using accessory muscles. He's not positioning himself to um, in an upright position so that he can breathe easier. Um, it maybe is just just on the high end of normal for him. And then we look at circulation to the skin. Now this is going to be interesting for this little guy because he's African American, and so we really want to look at. Um, his mucous membranes because his skin pigmentation isn't going to tell us anything. So for him we're going to look um, we're going to look on the inside of his lips and the mucous membranes like in his eyes and he is pale um, there when we look. So that's kind of the big thing we're seeing there is that paleness. So um, what's our general impression? Is this kid sick? And if he's sick is he a little sick or a lot sick? So think about that and figure out, you know, where are you going to put him in this scale rather than just waiting for me to tell you. Okay. So about the only abnormality we really see with him is that paleness or that pallor. Um, but because this kiddo is having severe pain, that certainly, um, that certainly requires our attention. So let's think of pain as our, um, severe pain, as our fifth vital sign. So if we've got a patient that has pain, even if all their vitals are normal, we want to think about that pain because that pain is telling us that something is wrong. Okay? 
So let's look at our um, assessment. We'll go a little further into this assessment and see if we can figure out how to help this kiddo. Okay, um, his airway is patent. He's breathing at a respiratory rate of about 30, um, which is on the high end of normal, but not too bad. Um, his lungs are clear, and he is sitting 97% on room air. So uh, nothing there. Um, his heart rate's 130, and uh, 130 is a little fast for him. Not not huge, but a little bit fast. Um, he does have good peripheral pulses, um, but when you look to check his cap refill, which again we know is good on a good tool to use on kids, not so much on adults, and especially not good on older people. But uh -huh, he's two, so we look. He does have pale nail beds and pale lips, and his uh, cap refill is a little delayed. And he has a blood pressure of 100 over 66, um, which is not a bad blood pressure at all for a two-year-old. So a disability we're looking at. So we're looking at the ABCs. We've got those down. Look at disability, and that's his neural function. So how well is his, what's his mental status like? Um, he's alert. He's responding to questions appropriately. Um, we want to make sure he can feel and move everything and that his pupils are pearl. So really the only thing we find with him um, in his disability is that, that everything is normal. Okay. Um, we, because he's got pain in both legs, we obviously want to expose those legs and look at those. And we're looking for, remember, DCAP, BTLS, things that would cause pain. So we're looking for contusions, bruising, swelling, deformities, um, any of those things. And when we look at his legs, we don't see anything abnormal. His legs look perfectly fine. But if you touch them, even just very gently, um, it causes a tremendous amount of pain for this little guy. Um, and he's not willing to move them much because it causes so much pain. So really now we've got, you know, kind of a high, little high f um, heart rate. Um, he's a little pale in his mucous membranes, and we've got that pain in his legs. So what else do you want to know about this kid? I mean, this is kind of a... Um, kind of a quandary at this point because we really don't have any answers to why his legs hurt so badly. Um, so some of the things I'd like to ask is, you know, the events leading up to what was happening and uh, this little kid was just playing and playing on the floor and his legs started to hurt and he started to cry and it's just con consistently got worse. Uh, Dad says it, he doesn't believe he's been hurt, he didn't fall, he was simply playing on the floor with some toys when it happened. So that kind of adds to the mystery also um, because we really don't have any reason. Okay. So let's talk about the sickle cell part of it. Okay, Dad tells you that he was diagnosed with sickle cell disease in a newborn screening. Um, his first crisis with this disease um, was called dactylitis and basically that means um, an inflammation in the vessels. And that happened when he was eight months old. He's had two prior crises, um, what we call vaso-occlusive, and I'll explain that in just a minute. Um, two prior crises, and both of them required him to be admitted to the hospital. Um, Dad tells you he's on prophylactic penicillin twice daily. Um, and so when you ask about a fever, because he's on penicillin, so you're thinking maybe infection, um, Dad tells you there was no fever uh, preceding this illness. He, he didn't have a fever. He was playing and doing just fine. So the other thing that Dad can tell you is that um, this kiddo's normal hemoglobin is 8.5. I know that doesn't mean a lot to you um, because we don't know what normal hemoglobin should be, and that's okay. We're not going to expect you to know that. But um, if you ask Dad, uh, Dad tells you that that is low and that this kiddo always looks pale because his hemoglobin always is low. So hemoglobin is the thing that helps our red blood cells transport oxygen. And when they don't have proper hemoglobin, then they can't perfuse well, so they are going to be pale. Um, and that's his normal. So we know that he doesn't perfuse well because of that hemoglobin issue. Dad also tells you that he gave oxycodone uh, 30 minutes ago and did not get any relief. So if we don't know a lot about that, 
then um, we might ask, what is oxycodone? Um, and it is a narcotic painkiller. Uh, so my next question would be, was that prescribed to this child? Um, and dad goes to get the bottle. It is prescribed to this child specifically for these types of issues. Um, so that's a very, very strong painkiller, especially for a two-year-old. So that tells you that um, at some point a physician felt like it was needed to go to that strong of a painkiller. It also tells you if they gave oxycodone, um, which is one of the strongest painkillers, and he did not get any relief. This kid's having a really serious um, pain issue. And so we need to address that. Okay, um, We don't need to have this kid hurting. So I think um, requesting ALS would be more than appropriate um, to at least address the pain issue. So number one, we can move him easier. Number two, we can get this under control for him. So here's a picture of sickle cell. And as you can see, this is an actual picture of blood. You can see we've got a normal red blood cell. It's kind of a round disc shape here. And it's got a little divot in the middle for the oxygen to attach to. That's how they normally look. But in a person that has sickle cell disease, some of their red blood cells are going to be shaped like this, more like a sickle. Um, and they don't really have a place um, they're not really built conducive to transporting oxygen. Um, so another thing that happened with these guys is, um, so you've got your normal red blood cells here, but these sickle cells have kind of all jammed up here, and we call this log jamming. And so they've kind of all jammed up in this vessel, and so anything south of here is not going to get adequate oxygenation because none of these red blood cells carrying oxygen can get through there. It's also going to create pressure in this vessel and a lot of pain. So the pain's going to come from all these cells that are not being oxygenated and this um, vasoocclusiveness here, this um, pressure that's going to build up here. So that is kind of how sickle cell is. There's no uh, treatment for it um, and there's no cure for it. Uh, it is hereditary. Now remember this little guy was diagnosed by a newborn screening. So in looking at sickle cell, it um, stays primarily with our dark-skinned ethnicities. So um, primarily African-American people carry it, um, more men than women. And sometimes you will see Middle Eastern uh, cultures that have that very dark skin uh, with sickle cell disease. But more often than not, it's um, African-American uh, people that can uh, have this, and it is hereditary. So my guess is since he was screened at birth that there is a history in his family of sickle cell disease, so they were uh, watching for that when he was born. Okay. So overall, we've done a pretty good assessment. We've checked him out. Um, what do you think we need to do for him? Uh, as an EMT, I mean, we could move him and take him to the hospital, and maybe we could do that. So top priority would be to not cause him any more pain, so moving him very gently. Uh, we talked before about getting ALS en route, so we can have them address the pain. They can certainly uh, get some pain meds on board and see if we can uh, manage that pain a little better. And then we need to think about where we're going to take him. Now, he's had two vaso-occlusive incidents in the past, so he obviously has a physician that he sees, and he also has records at a hospital, so um, talk with the parents and find out where they want him to go, and see if you can get him to the place that is familiar with him and is familiar with this disease and the treatment. So if he's been seen at Children's, then maybe let's take him to Children's. If he's seen um, here locally, then uh, let's go to the, the hospital that um, his physician can see him at. And we also want to, um, this isn't a 911 coat, lights, and sirens. This is going to be a very smooth, easy transport so we don't cause him any more pain. And then hopefully meet up with ALS en route. Okay. So here's some things about anemia. Anemia is that inability to, oxyg or to uh, transport oxygen molecules. So he's breathing fine, he's breathing oxygen in. It's just that his red blood cells aren't able to transport that effectively. 
Okay. So anemia in a child with sickle cell disease can be caused for two reasons. Okay. Um, one is um, or not anemia, but tachycardia and paleness can be caused by two things. Anemia, um, which is just that his hemoglobin has gotten so low that it can't transport the oxygen. So with that, we're not going to have a fever. Um, we'll probably have a normal mental status. Um, he's just going to be weak, lethargic, um, not feeling good, very pale, and, um, and have good, strong peripheral pulses. Because in anemia, um, our, our our body still has the ability to vasoconstrict, so it's going to keep our blood pressure up. Um, our heart rate's going to go up, which is going to try and move the red blood cells around faster because the brain is recognizing that we're not getting enough oxygen. But we're going to be pale because uh, of the inability to perfuse. Then there's sepsis, and this can be the other reason. And we know that sepsis is a form of shock, and so it is going to trigger that sympathetic nervous response. So we're going to have tachycardia, and our patient's going to be pale because he's not perfusing well. But in a septic patient, you're much more likely to have an altered mental status because remember in sepsis, our vessels start, they dilate, and they become leaky. So they, they become um, uh, porous, and they start to um, leak. So that's going to drop our blood pressure down. Uh, maybe into the toilet. So our, we're not going to have good strong peripheral pulses. We're probably going to have a fever because remember we talked about infection and fever go hand in hand and then because of the low blood pressure um, and the dilated leaky vessels we're probably going to have an altered mental status. So the thing that we're looking for here, the easiest thing to recognize is the uh, mental status and the fever. And then when we check a pulse, uh, we're going to see a difference in that because of the blood pressure. So those are two reasons that we're going to have paleness um, and tachycardia in a child with um, sickle cell disease, or an adult. Adults have these too. The pain episodes that log jamming can occur in any part of the body. Um, we don't really know why they log jam sometimes and not others, but we know that it does happen. So the treatment for that is going to be a lot of fluids. So we want to try and like build up enough um, pressure to wash that log jam out and then pain management while we're doing that because that in and of itself is going to cause a lot of pain. Generally these incidents are self-limited and if we can just control the pain and support them making sure they have enough fluids they take care of themselves. However, sickle cell disease um, patients are at very high risk for serious infections um, because of the anemia, the body really can't fight off um, viruses and bacteria like other people. So things that we look for that are serious, um, pneumonia, uh, meningitis, which is the an infection in the meninges, that lining around the spinal cord and the brain. Um, osteomyelitis is uh, infection in the bone. Uh, on the muscles around the bone, and then septic arthritis. So all of those things can be very, very bad for our patient. And um, if you remember, this kiddo was on prophylactic penicillin. Um, so they're giving him penicillin twice a day because he does not have the ability to fight these things off should his body come in contact with them. So they want to be um, forward thinking on that and make sure that this doesn't take him down because he's have a hard time fighting it off. Um, they're most vulnerable to infections with what we call encapsulated bacteria. And two of those um, are salmonella, and you all know that's a food poisoning. And the other one is uh, pneumococcus, and the pneumococcus is a very bad form of a pneumonia um, bacteria. And tip a lot of times when people die from pneumonia, it's this one that, that causes that. So they can't really fight those off very well. So when they get sick, we need to... Uh, do a very thorough assessment and act very quickly. Okay. So if we've got a patient with a fever, um, then we need to consider that this child has a serious bacterial infection until proven otherwise. So we're going to go with worst case scenario. So take care of yourself, lots of BSI, um, and make sure that you're recognizing the seriousness of this and getting the patient to the proper location. Okay. Now, if we think about this log jamming effect that happens, 
that also puts them at high risk for stroke and heart attack and bleeding in the brain. So stroke and heart attacks are both caused by clots and clots that happen either in the heart or the brain. And so typically when we're assessing a two, three, five, six, ten year old, we're not thinking, you know, did they have a stroke or did they have a heart attack? But in these kids, we need to think that. And we need to uh, think it in our adults too that have sickle cell disease. It does put them at high risk for this. So um, look for those signs of stroke. Um, and you all know the classic signs, the facial droop, the slurred speech, the um, weakness or paralysis on one side, uh, the word salad, they can't really function, or maybe they can't speak at all. Um, and look for those signs of strokes. If this um, event resolves itself pretty quickly, it may end up being more like a TIA. Um, but um, in a heart attack, uh, the child may experience um, air hunger, may experience that chest pain, diaphoresis, those types of things, because a clot of sickle cells and a clot of plaque both have the same effect. So we could certainly have a child that does have a heart attack or a myocardial infarction um, because of this disease. And then bleeding in the brain. And when we get that log jam effect, the vessel that is beyond that um, occlusion can become weak and start to leak. And so therefore we can get bleeding in the brain. Um, and if there's enough pressure, it can actually um, burst one of those small vessels and get that bleeding in the brain, which therefore gives us a hemorrhagic stroke. Okay, So we want to watch for seizures and altered mental status um, because that can be signs of, of uh, these events. And then ask about their pain. Where is it? And, and uh, have them get a good assessment there. Okay, So that's a very quick overview on sickle cell disease. I think it was important enough to talk about today. Um, I hope this helps you know just a little more about it. So if you come in contact, you will be uh, able to deal with this effectively. Alrighty, have a great weekend.